he strikes me as a very, very nice, uh, extremely genuine individual, a yeah, very nice person. So this is Mr. George Vernon. Um, the recording is 38 minutes and 23 seconds long, uh, so it doesn't all fit on the side of this tape. Um, and so the, the small part that won't fit on this side is continues on side B of this cassette. So this is George Vernon. My name. I'm George Vernon. I was born at Coal Creek in 1922 when my father owned an orchard, having bought that after a stint of mining at Baikaya. Left there in 1929 to go to Dunedin to get education and unfortunately took ill when I was in Standard 6 and had to go to Queenstown where my father had become a mine manager at Arthur's Point called the Sugarloaf Claim. So, George, um, just going back, that, so did you go to boarding school? In, in I bought a farm. My father bought a farm there for us to get education. Oh, OK. Yeah. A dairy farm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't very successful because it was a depression. So anyway, I developed chest infection. How, how, how did you, how did that happen? I think mainly it was a damp air and whatnot in Dunedin. And uh, I went up to join my father at Arthur's Point. And from then on, I did some odd jobs as a cowboy on a farm at Gaston for a wee while. And in 1930. Six, I went up the shot over where my father had become manager of the Central Shot Over Gold Mining Company, and I stayed in the shot over for nine years. So you were, you were only fourteen. Yeah. Gosh. So how old were you when you left school? Twelve. Didn't even get to twelve. That obviously you could read and write. And I try. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But. Um, an interesting fact about this sugarloaf claim at Arthur's Point. My father had sluiced away a great slip on the side of the mountain and found that the bed of the rock sunk down and he put in a pump and sank down in this big hole and got some gold. And then the hill moved and no one got back in there, collapsed and all buried. And 60 years later, my brother, who had become superintendent of the Ward Mill at Carver out in the North Island, got a bonus payment of $30,000 and decided to come back to Arthur's Point and put a tunnel into this particular place where this gold was. And he worked away there for some time with not a great deal of success because he was not a miner and he eventually sold the place out and two men from Queenstown took over and got quite a considerable amount of gold in a very short period of time. So what, what sort of year would you be looking at there? Just recently? Well, 70, 80 something. Okay. Yeah. Look at the photos. Yeah, proof. So anyway, after that uh, after point episode, we ended up the shot over and worked for the Central Shot Over Gold Mining Company, was Dunedin Company, and worked at the bed of the Shot Over River for over five miles completely from side to side over a period of eight years with varying success. The best effort was in 1939. In one period of three weeks got 147 ounces of gold, which was so monstrous amount. What type of equipment were you using? Hydraulic elevating. Okay. Yeah, pipes, mm -hmm. pipeline, mm -hmm. elevator. And you, you would have needed a few men for that? To Up to six work shifts. But there was a massive pipeline supplying the water, 18 inch pipes, came down a gorge from a big dam. And in 1940, there was a massive flood, and this destroyed the dam and the pipeline, so the claim closed down. But there were very episodes there. So you you were just on what wages then? Yes. Yeah. You, yeah, you yeah. didn't get a, you you didn't get a percentage of the take. No, 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 no. Just yeah. on wages. Did any gold go missing? Well, it's strange you should say that, because I recall my father, we had a boardway across the pipeline where it crossed the river, 
and we had a cook shop where the men were fed and my father came in, we were sitting down having a cup of tea and he came in and said, somebody's had their pockets too full, he found a little nugget lying on the boardwalk. Came across the river, of course it was a deathly silence, so somebody might have been borrowing something. <laughs> but anyway, this, this flood that destroyed this pipeline had to, they said at the time in Queenstown, the river rose 27 feet at Deep Creek, which is quite a wide area of the river. They said that you could hear the shot over the river from Queenstown, you could hear the roar of it. And it just absolutely wiped out everything in its path. Unbelievable. Yeah. And would it come up quite quickly? Yes, it did rise quickly. We always allowed, by the time it started raining in the back country at the head of the shot over, we could see the clouds. It would be six hours before the flood arrived, but this one came from every quarter. Snow, mm -hmm. big snow melted very quickly. So that put the end to that claim. And, uh, and so what, what would happen at times like that? Would, would everyone just lose their jobs or you would stay yeah. with the company and go somewhere else? Or? Well, uh, no, this company closed down. Yeah. There was no way they all went away different jobs. Okay. One chap went up to work in a quartz mine, which I'll mention later. And so there's no such thing as redundancy then? No, no, no such thing. No. And I went and worked for a, a chap at Sandhills, which was another gold mine, about another 12 mile up the river, and worked there for a year. Quite interesting here too, the only time I ever saw blue gold. They're washing up in the boxes, and these little blue flakes, about some as big as your fingernail, little fingernail, were blue, and you'd think, well, it's heavy because it stayed in the boxes with the gold, and you'd scratch them and there was gold underneath. Okay. So where that coloration came from, I've never had anybody satisfactorily explain to me. Didn't know it. Tell me, at that, at that time, tell me what your average day would have been, you know? You know, like what, what time would you have got up and, and what would your first sort of job have been? Oh, I usually worked, in the company, you work shifts. And so, so many eight hour shifts. Okay. But working privately, you just work whenever you felt like with the boss. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, for a company, it was never more than eight hours? Never more than eight hours, yeah. no, no. Okay. Unless it was a flood. If you had a flood, you obviously went to try and save gear if it got sort of knocked about at all. And so what, what did you do during the day? Like, what was your actual job on the. Working as hydrant in the clay, sluicing the stuff into an elevator. Which you, uh, was, uh, Hard work? Hard manual work? No, not really. No. Not really. There's one of the holes there. There's, um, we've got one of an elevator here somewhere going. And it's under snow in the same area. There we go. So you'd See, be standing at the bottom? Standing here working. Oh, you'd, be, you'd standing, be standing at the top? Yeah, and somebody always standing at the bottom of the elevator to stop big stones getting jammed in the mouth of the elevator. Mm. And that's what you do all day? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Ever get monotonous? Or? Not at all. No? No. no. You've got to like mining or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I just wonder. Because yeah. 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 to an outsider, you know, if you don't know anything about it, it might think, oh, well, you just stand there all day and, you know. But no. Oh, and then, of course, you have to ship pipeline all the time. You're shifting up the river or down the river or over bluffs and yeah. did some tremendous stuff putting pipes over bluffs and that, different times. You just went further up the river or further back down again. That's a good one for mm. and, and, and in your time off, would you go hunting or anything like that? I used to hunt goats. Yeah. yeah. There's a, we had a pipeline across the river for a start, and that's working in. Okay. We, these bridges, we put the pipes across, were rather interesting. We had blue gum poles in Queenstown, about 20 feet long. A so, you, more. You did all, so you actually got quite a lot of variety then? Oh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. you would do all that. And too. we manufactured a pile driver, our own design. It was worked with a rope on one end and a heavy weight on the other on a fulcrum. And you pulled it down, let it go, and it hit the pile. It, after about two days you managed to drive one about ten feet into the river that <laughs> bed but, uh, and then you put the pipes across and these things and I mention this too because in the winter time these paddocks as we call them that we'd worked out 
were left full of water because a river does not rise in the winter time. The snow and frost yeah. actually lowers. Yeah. And on one occasion, this um, they would freeze up to 14, 15 inches of frost easily. And on one occasion, when the spring came, the river rose up and lifted this great sheet of ice out of this paddock, as we called it, and came floating down the river, went straight through the bridge, took all the blue gum piles, pipes, and everything. Hardly even paused on the track. It's like a big iceberg. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah a, a piece. So you, what you could see that? You we saw it happen. No, Couldn't gosh. do anything about it. Couldn't do anything about it. So in the winter, did you still work in the winter? No. 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 So how did you get paid? You didn't get paid. Right. Uh, we shot goats, and caught rabbits, yeah. and things like that. But oh, it wasn't very long really because it was all sorts of jobs and making bolts for bridges and oiling bolts. Another thing you had to do in between the pipes was what they call a ring. There's a steel ring packed with sacking. Yeah. And you had to wrap these rings, and that took quite a considerable amount of time. Did you put tar on them or something? Was was it, at that time, you could get uh, sacking that had tar paper on it, mm -hmm. and you used to buy that. Mm -hmm. Use that for wrapping. Yeah, and then for, just get bolted on. Sort of. Yeah, well, it, it was a ring that you slid in between the bolts and the right. flanges of the pipes. Yeah, yeah. And that, there was always something to it. Yeah. Most of the time, you were always shooting goats or rabbits or skins. So it must have been at times very cold at work, you know, with your certain times of the year. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, especially working with those pipes, it must yeah. have been very. Well, you daren't pick up your tools first thing in the morning and kick them into the water to get there because they take the palm off your head yeah. quite easily. And funnily enough, we never wore gloves. I don't know why yeah. till this day. It's <laughs> I don't know why nobody ever wore gloves. So, and what, what, was your, what was your accommodation like there, just house? Well, or? my mother and father had a house, and my brother and I had a, a tent that had a corrugated iron roof on it and a wooden floor. And mm. you lived in that all year round? Yeah. Yeah. Very cold. We and, a, and, and fireplace? No. No? No fireplace. In 1939, in the big snow, there was 33 inches of snow outside the hut and my father had to get a shovel to dig, dig the door out to let us out. <laughs> so no heating at all? No. No? no. no. And, and what about bedding? Just real heap of blankets. warm blankets. And, yeah. and were you cold? Not really. No. We used to have an argument the cat used to come in and we used to have an argument where we could have the cat in bed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Run the night. Yeah. 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 And what about um, social life in those days? You know, like how, how did it socially... Oh. It didn't appear to be much relief, there was nothing to do. The heyday of mining had gone, there was nothing either. Nothing like that at all, I don't know. But like how did, you know, how did you, you guys get to meet the girls, or you know, how did you sort of meet your wife? Well, no, that was many years later, okay. when I went to Granorke, she liked mining. Okay. No, there was, a, there was one big company there called Skipper's Limited, it's been untold tens of thousands of dollars in a failed project right from the start. They built a fluming made of four foot square steel plates that they intended to turn this whole shot over river into like a water race. Well, that was fair enough. They did it in the winter time and great it was about a mile long. It cost I think at the time over sixty thousand pounds. And the first flood that came it had a bend in the fluming. And if you have a bend in a water race you have a camber. Okay. because the water rises when it hits the outside of the river went straight over the side and took the side out of the flash flume and that was the end of it. <laughs> so they decided that they weren't going to turn the shot over after all and they carried on mining for a while and they had a failing that their water races didn't supply enough water for a full day's work to do their elevating or sluicing you see. So they spent another £28,000 putting in a power scheme six mile up the river dammed the Skipper's Creek, put in a great pipeline, put in a powerhouse, put the pipes down, and of all things they did, instead of utilising electricity to try pump water and that sort of thing, they pumped the water up the hill to the dam, 300 feet. That was another disaster, so they went broke. <laughs> yeah. And that's where the L&M and them mining, I think in that particular bit of beach, got over five million 
pounds worth of gold, dollars worth of gold. Okay. Because we had no idea of strange people from Auckland and Wellington trying to be miners. Um, just going back a wee bit, do you recall we, uh did you ever? Did you know your grandfather? Because he was a miner. I never saw my oh, grandfather. Okay. No, he died. Do you, do you recall your father talking about you know you, what your grandfather got up to mining wise, or did your oh, father have sort of mining stories? Um, well, it's quite a history in a book about Waikai. My grandfather came to Ballarat and Bendigo in Australia in 1855. Came to New Zealand in 1863. Specifically to gold mine? Yes, yeah. gold mining at Chapeka Mount for six years and then he shipped it to Waikai. There were shares in a claim called the Anglo-Swiss and so on. It went broke but he carried on different projects there. And then, he, an interesting fact about him, he had a, a lady friend coming out from Scotland to get married, so this is alright. He went to meet her at Port Chalmers and she changed his, her mind and wouldn't marry him. He knew her before. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. she came out specifically and were going to get married. So he was stopping at a boarding house and the manager of the boarding house said there's a young girl here. They had a scheme in those days to bring out domestics. He said she seems a likely type. So my grandfather married her and took her back to Waikai. And that was your grandmother? Yeah, that was my grandmother. Well, and they, they, the, she married her just like that? Yes, yeah. in a few days. Uh, I'm led to believe I haven't checked the record, but I'm led to believe they were the first couple married in Knox Church in Dunedin. It was just built at that point in time. But anyway, another interesting fact about him, he brought her back to a cottage he built in the Waikai, up the end of the Waikai bush, and there was a massive tree stump that he'd cut off, and half the tree stump was a kitchen table, and the other half was the dressing table in the bedroom. <laughs> so she might have got a bit of a shock to the system. I think possibly. But however, eventually he built a hotel and had the Whitecomb Hotel at the junction of Whitecomb and Waikai River and stayed there till 1905 when he shifted over to Rock. Just running the hotel? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and probably uh, he, he must have had stores because uh, I recall seeing a docket for uh, stuff they bought in, casks of brandy. And one thing that interested me was three child's collars and a penny halfpenny each. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway... So would he, your grandfather die before you were born? Or sort of no, you know? uh, I'd be about four or something okay, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I forget when he died. I had it, I think. Died, so. I think it was. Died in it, retired to Oxford in 1905, but I don't know when he died. It must have been about, uh, about 1920, perhaps. Before you I was born. Do what, what he died of, just old age? Or? I would say old age, yes. Yeah. 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 So my father had done a bit of mining in the Waikai and that when he was a youth, and he'd done shearing and all that sort of thing. And he had managed a claim called the Breakamore at one period, and that became the King Solomon Mine. Okay. And then he shipped it over to Roxburgh, and he did a bit of work on a coal mine there and various things. And then in the start of the Depression, when he bought this dairy farm in Dunedin for us to get education, he went back to Waikai, left my mother and six of us children in Dunedin, on the hope of finding some gold where he had worked. And he Why? Because the Depression was just too tough? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. But I, think, I think they got about five shillings a week or something, subsidy or something like that. So your mother sort of tried to keep we, the farm going? And we milked cows yeah. and uh, sold the milk. Do you remember those... Do you remember those days being tough? Do you they were tough, all right. Yeah. yeah. Pretty hard. We used to walk to school three miles, to go to school, be your feet. Yeah. What about food? Do you remember going oh. to the Mind you, being on the dairy farm, it's probably would have been enough milk and stuff, anyway. <laughs> I think probably leading to my getting a bit sick. At this particular time, I'd never eat my lunch because I couldn't stand jam sandwiches and I'd throw them away. That's probably why I became ill. <laughs> but here we were. No, it was tough days in those days. Mm -hmm. Interesting with all the old wagons and stuff, the sta just at the start of the motor vehicles, really. Mm -hmm. The <coughs> Rodman tramways had a steam truck that carted the coal from the Green Island up to the tram sheds where they generate the steam. Those kids used to love watching this thing. 
and the driver fed it with a fire shovel. Okay. And a heap of coal beside him and drove along. So you recall the men still having horse stall? Oh, well, no, they, they oh, had tram cars, oh, okay. had tram cars, but yeah. we had a horse and gig. We used to go into town if we had to. And most people had horse and gig. Yeah. Very few motor cars. What about horses in the mining industry? Was there when you were starting? Not a great deal. No. No, not a great no, deal. They, they were used. There were still a few in that book. They did pack horses. Right. The pack horse had a great place in the mining for, because it was, was inaccessible. Even today, there's no machinery you can get where the pack horses went. Mm-hmm. Cutting pipes and sledge and stuff. That was later in the sea light era. Okay. Horses were the main thing there. Yeah. So tell me about that sea light. How you got into it? Oh well, um, after I got, I got in 1941, I got man care. I got I volunteered for the army, and I got man care out straight away because I was a miner mm-hmm. and sent to Glenorchy to mine sea light. Mm-hmm. So what, what was she like used for exactly? Hardening steel. Okay. And even today, your electric light bulbs, that's tungsten. They haven't found anything to take its place from. And is that she light? Tungsten. That's tungsten. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. It's used for hardening steel. And, and so they still use it to harden steel? Yes. Yeah. Uh, they, it was a great uh, thing for, for wartime because it made gun barrels. So what, what does it look like? Well, she light itself is just a white or in quartz, it's yeah. pretty indefinable. You can really tell it okay. any different from quartz. So how, how do you mine it then? Like is the it tunnel, like tunnel in the mountains. So is it like coal, there's just like a big seam of it? Yeah. 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 It's yeah. not like gold where you have to put it through a... Oh yes, you put it through exactly the same process as gold. Oh, okay. Almost identical. Oh, okay. Except so like a river water even? Yeah, we have tables that oscillate. Yeah. So that, is it only small stuff? Oh, very fine. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. so it's it's not, this one means not like a big... And what, okay. when you get down to you know, residue that could have some shelite left and little bits of quartz, you put it through a stamping battery exactly the same as gold. Okay. And so it's obviously very heavy then? Very, very heavy. Yeah. 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 I could give you an example. I've got a piece here I'll show you later. Heavier than gold? No. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. no. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's somewhere about... If you use a figure of 10 for gold, I think she likes about 8. Okay. Yeah. So, in those days, did the government pay you? Like a yes, we're working yeah. for the government. Yeah, yeah. so you yeah. work with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. When first went there, there was uh, just little huts for accommodation, and then they built a cook shop. Yeah. I worked at Paradise, with the head of, way up the head of Lake Wakata, and I worked about 14 mile out of Granorke, and I worked there underground. And they built a cook shop, and that was marvellous because it got all their meals and all that. So they must have gone pretty cold underground, was it? Yeah. No, underground's a, a marvellous thing, really. Mm-hmm. I prefer it to any other life, actually, because get in there out of the heat in the summer and get in there out of the cold in the winter. Okay. Yeah, it's, it maintains a sort of a steady temperature around about 68, 70. Okay. So, unless you want draft, you put on the air to get rid of gelignite smoke and that, you do that sort of thing. Yeah. So you'd have to um, prop up everything as you went? Some places you do, some, some you don't. Okay. I had worked in my own mine later, and after the war, I went away in the Air Force for a while, and after the war I went back to Kanawki. I'd got married in the meantime, and uh, I went private mining on my own. She liked? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. And how did that compare to my um, gold price-wise? Well, at one point in time it was a pound a pound, which was a huge price, but it didn't last. But she, compared to gold? That well, oh, much better than gold. Okay. Yeah, yeah. At that particular point in time, oh, right. yes. Okay. But she light is not found like gold. Gold's really consistent, in quartz especially. But she light, you wouldn't know. You could work for a year and see nothing and then get perhaps a tonne of it in a, a week. Okay. It's been proved by different mines that worked for a long length of time didn't succeed very well and then all of a sudden struck a great heap of I mentioned here the Wiley brothers that started before the war or just the start of the war and they drove a tunnel into the mountain about 180, 200 feet and they got very little and they were getting a subsidy from the government and it had risen to somewhere in the vicinity of 3,000 pounds which was a lot of money and they came back and they turned to right and went 20 feet and got 40 tonnes of shelite 
non-stop. That's amazing. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. 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 yeah and they were the only people at Kanoki that got the top price for she light that was ever paid. Two thousand two hundred and forty eight pounds a ton. Pounds a ton. Quality. Yes. Yeah. Well it's based on quality because yeah. you you are paid by the quality. You paid ninety percent of the value of your export and when it was assayed overseas you got a balance or a bill. It seldom happened. You never got a bill really. I've never heard of she like mining before. Oh. I, I, I only mentioned it, you know, not long ago, but that's the first time I heard of it. Oh fascinating. There was a lot of miners. Uh, Book Miners in the Cloud tells all about that. Okay. Mentioned most of the miners. Did you mine anything other than she and gold? No. No, 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 no. Did you come across Greenstone? Uh, no, not really. It was a funny thing. I was told by an old, old man at Glenorchy by the name of Bill Grant, who was born in Glenorchy somewhere about 1870, mm -hmm. that when he was a kid, at the head of the Rockburn Valley, there was a, ma a track leading down to a quarry of greenstone made by the Maoris, and he said it had fallen in. And it had been, well, about 1970-something, they found some in the Rockburn Valley, and it was mined there, and it was on the exact opposite side of this mountain ridge, so it was obviously the same seam must run right through that oh. ridge to where the miner... So it's always interesting, this old fellow, he said, well, he said this Maori track existed. Yeah. And nobody's ever mentioned it in history or anything where they mined this Greenstone. Incredible old fellow. He carted a dredge from the Norky right up to the Dart Flats, 40 mile up the Dart River with horses. <laughs> in pieces, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So when you got married, um, did your wife stay, you know, when you went mining, did your wife stay in town? She stayed at home. Okay. Yeah. I was what, in Alex? In uh, Glenorchy. Oh, Glenorchy. I was a bit fortunate. The <coughs> government had houses and huts and everything, and they, after the war finished, they put them all down and sold them. Right. And I applied for one of them, and being a return soldier, I got one of them. So to rent or to buy or to buy? Yeah, and so you had a wee section at Glenorchy. Yeah. yeah, okay. I uh, had the house on a section. I paid six hundred and sixty pound for it, and I bought the section next door for seven pounds ten. My wife nearly divorced me. <laughs> I'd hate to think what it's worth today. Oh, I know. Prices um, there just, just oh, beyond a joke. I can't even get my head around prices there. Well, you know, around Wanaka and Queenstown, it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and after the she what did you Well, uh, actually, Inspector of Mines said to me, he said, uh, you know, you have tickets for this and that. He said, but you haven't got a quarry manager's ticket. And he said, there's not much mining left unless it's coal. He said, if you go down to Capri, he said, you'd go to one of the lime works. So I went to Belter okay. in Southland. Yeah. And I worked there for about seven months. I got my ticket, quarry manager's ticket, and... Uh, so you took the family there? Yes, yeah. built yeah. a new house there. Yeah. And uh, I mean, one day I met a, oh, a semi-relation and he said, are you looking for a job anywhere? Well, I don't know. And he said, well, I can tell you good when they're starting a line works at Tiana. And he said, my father-in-law owns the area. Here we go. So I had a go and I landed the job and stayed 26 years. And where was that at, just out of Tiana? Out of Tiana, 20 miles from Tiana, underneath the Takatima Mountains, a place called Elmwood, oh, so on the road to Black Mount. Okay, oh, on that road. And there were very few people that I speak to ever knew there was lime works there. Except and you actually lived on site? Like, yes. Yeah. I lived in an old hut for a start, which was pretty basic, and a year later, the boss gave my wife a brand new house. And where did the kids, the kids, go, the kids <coughs> go to Black Mount School? No, I only had one daughter, and she went to the Elmwood School. They built okay. a school there for the farm. And right, how yeah. interesting. Yeah. So how often would you have gone to um, Tiana for groceries? And Once things? a week. Okay, yeah. 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 We also had to go to lands. And we were, actually, we supplied to lands and survey with lime. That was why it was there, the oh, lime okay. work. I had no idea there were lime works there. Oh. I knew about sort of Balfour area, but... You know. When I went there first, there were five stations, big stations, owned the whole of the valley, and the government bought most of them out. Yeah. 
And when I left 26 years later, we had 154 farmers on the books. Gosh. That's what the Lands and Survey did for the yeah. Outstanding. A lot of Lands and Survey books. Mm. They, they developed did. lots of them. They spent a great deal of money, certainly did, but they did a tremendous job there for the farmers. And the farmers, they're reaping the profits now, of course, but mm. selling them away and that. No, and that was an interesting enough job too. See, I was going to say, how, how does the lime mining compare to the gold mining? Is it as oh, interesting? Oh, no, no, it's a totally different, different thing. Different ballgame. Just yeah. what you're relying on there, seeing how much tonnage you can produce in a day, because we not only produced it, we sowed it on the paddocks. Oh, OK. And, and you were the manager of the whole thing? And eventually yeah. I became the manager. Okay. Yeah, and managed it for, this for 11 years. Yeah. Yeah. interesting. And eventually that crash came in the farming and it no longer was economic and they closed down. Mm -hmm. So you lost a job? Well, put it that way, I left in oh, okay. yeah. retired to Alexandra. And that was your last mining that you yeah. did? Yeah. Oh, while I was there too, interestingly enough too, uh, the why our river was dammed with the Marrow Weir, and there had been talk, I always studied geology, of traces of gold. The first trace of gold found in Fiordland was where the track from Jacob's River to Tiana, across the, what is the name of that creek? Not the Worry, another creek just above there. So I went down to look at this place and the old track could be seen. So I dug in the bed of the creek and got a wee few flakes of gold. Okay. So, so was it you that was telling me there's not much gold in Fiordland? Or there's no known source no of gold in Fiordland itself. Yeah. The, the geologist's idea is that when the glaciers were up about 3,000 feet higher, they carried residue that came through from Milwaukee and joined the Mararoa River and then came down to where the present Mararoa Weir is built and there was some gold mining done there by Chinese mm -hmm. way back and then down the way out to uh, Black Mount, below Black Mount, a place called Sunnyside, there was a bit of mining done there. Right. And then, of course, you go to Oropoki and out to the sea. Yeah. There was a dredge put on the way our river went part of it, but it never did any good. Okay. Mm. Seems to be an awful, have been an awful lot of bridges on um, parts of the Clutha, yeah. you know, like Mount Mills, Rat, um, Roxburgh, so. Uh, interesting. There's actually quite a, I've seen two two wrecks of bridges, uh, the, the Dunedin's, seen the Dunedin and another one. I don't know the other one, but uh, the Dunedin, you can actually see it when they're, you know, they see the top mm. of it still. Mm. Yeah. That, it's quick, I was mentioning Excelsior Creek, I've just remembered the name of it. Interesting enough, this creek had some odd formation all out the head of it, and I've been led to believe, I no doubt that will never be allowed to be worked, that there's a seam in there equal to McRae's, okay. and that must be where this bit of gold came down this creek from. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's why a government geologist told me the facts, and I've got samples in the drawer here that he gave me to prove it. Oh. Yeah. So. And he said they'll never be uh, conservationists, they'll never allow it to be touched, of course. Well, I was going to say too, like when you were, um, you know, quite a few years ago, you know, you, you must have, the, you know, the water, uh, the hydraulic system, you must, you know, you probably wouldn't get away with that now, would you? Oh, no. No, because, no, no. you know, it must have made it made the water pretty lucky. Well, oh, that, yes, of course, and yeah. filled all the river beds, all the sluicing, great sluicing claims on the banks of the river, washing stuff into the river, without any worry about it. And that filled all your river beds up in the course of all the lakes getting filled up now with silt like Lake Dunstan and that sort of thing with the Quarry River. Yeah. gradually emptying out. Well, we worked at Deep Creek, at Central Shotover, when I worked there. There was 16 feet of gravel on the average in the bed of the river. There wouldn't be two feet today. Oh. It's all been washed away because there's none coming in from the top, okay. or very little, because mm -hmm. all the mining stopped. And just briefly, um, do, you, do you remember any Chinese miners still hanging around when you were a kid? No, when I was in uh, Queenstown, there were two old miners, one left in Arrowtown and one left in Queenstown. And old Chinese miners. Old Chinese yeah. miners, and they, they sat on a street on a chair or on a bench and, a, and had a yarn. If you went past, they talked to you. Yeah, and they wouldn't still be mining there? No, 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 no. They were old, old men. And how would they have survived? Then? Oh, I think they'd probably got a pension from yeah. the government, I would think. I would think so.
because most of the Chinese miners would eventually gone back. Yeah, yeah, China. yeah. Did you, that, do you remember your father talking about them? Or? Oh yeah, Dad talked about them a lot because the Chinese like children, and when it came to Chinese New Year or their birthdays, they got a person where pots full of preserved ginger given to them, okay. and all in syrup, and they loved that. And occasionally they put a side over the roof for the Chinese hut chimney and get told off for doing that. <laughs> but my grandfather, strangely enough, had an aversion to Chinamen, for what reason I'll never know. And so he hated them? He did, and he spent the latter years of his life writing letters to the paper about uh, what will happen in years to come, the Chinese will take over the world. So you felt very threatened? And that was in 1900. And strangely enough, I don't know whether you've heard of Lionel Terry, who wrote a book called The Yellow Peril. Oh. and said the same thing, mm -hmm. and this was, oh, so it was 1920 something, and to make a point about his book, he walked down the street in Wellington and shot the first Chinaman he saw, and killed him. And he said he picked an old fellow because he didn't want to shoot anybody young, and he went to a mental asylum, and only perhaps three years ago was he released because he was dying. And it, Lionel Terry wrote a book called The Yellow Peril, and he said that Chinese will take over the world at the time. So that's, that's the only thing I know about Chinese yeah. people. But yeah. my father always said they were scrupulously honest. Okay. But my father said that. Yeah. They um, they never. I, I gather they only. Well, I, I gather they followed the Myers. Yes. They never sort of went out themselves and started. You know, Not that I know of. No, they, no, they, they tend didn't. to sort of follow behind and yeah. pick up the, you know. They actually went to most places where the average um, oh, the white miner wouldn't work mm -hmm. because the time was no object to a Chinese person. Yeah. And it did some incredible things, you know. And they, they didn't need much to live on either. That was another point. Their one ambition was to make enough money to go home to China. Mm -hmm. And there was always a legend told, I can't name the boat, but there was, uh, I think it was somewhere about 140 corpses were retrieved to be sent home to China. And the story is told that a lot of them were disemboweled and gold was put in the, the cavities to go home to the people at home. And there is some amount of truth in this, and by some strange of fortune, this boat pounded off the Cape Edmond and they were all drowned. And then their bodies never ever got to China. Mm -hmm. But that was rumoured with, with some degree of uh, I think proof. Might, you think there might be a bit of truth to that? Yeah, and uh, that even if it perhaps was in their clothing in the body. Because a lot of them would have died here. Well, the percentage would have died here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There was no, not many, not many of the Chinese women came out. I don't think so. No, no very few I've ever heard of. Yeah. Yeah. There was one Chinese person who made a great fortune. That was Su Hoi. He had dredges. He had the first dredges on the shot over, and he made a fortune, uh -huh. absolute fortune. He pioneered dredging, and uh, he went back to Dunedin, and I think they were a company in clothing and all that sort of thing. Okay. Su Hoi's. Okay. I think they still exist today. The name. Yeah. 